tonight. Thank you. Matthew chapter 4 in your Bibles tonight, please. Matthew chapter 4. It is hard to believe that we are to Thursday night. I remember when we came, the first meeting, it was 2012, and we pulled up our fifth wheel trailer over there and trying to figure out how to get that uh, backed into the spot. And I remember uh, my son, John, and uh, Caleb, those two little blonde heads running off, and they've been friends ever since. <laughs> and uh, it's been a delight to be here uh, over the years, and I thank the Lord for this church. I thank the Lord for your pastor. And, uh, you know, ever since that very first meeting, we've always had uh, what I would consider very uh, enriching conversations. I, uh, it's mutual. I remember going over there to the coffee shop that very first time and just talking about all sorts of stuff, and uh, it's been a delight uh, every time. And I appreciate uh, your pastor. He, uh, he has a real heart for the reality of the Lord. And it's not just going through motions. You know, it's, it's way more than ritual. It's a relationship with Jesus. And I appreciate his willingness to put the focus where it ought to be. And a delight to be back with him, his family, and all of you, the church family here. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for having hungry hearts and upturned faces and uh, a willingness to uh, hear from heaven. And so I appreciate your prayer and all of that. As Pastor mentioned, my next meeting is in Indiana, and uh, then uh, I go back uh, home for just a couple of days, and then I catch a short meeting, training time for the neighborhood Bible time guys, and then head over to Ireland, and then down to Ohio, and uh, so on. The summer schedule gets weird, uh, but uh, nonetheless, as the Lord brings us to mind, we certainly appreciate your prayer. It's been a delight. All right, Matthew chapter 4 in the Word of God tonight, as we go to one more truth that uh, builds on what we've looked at thus far. Matthew 4, I'll begin to read in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net. By the way, that's where we get net casters from, <laughs> of these concepts right here in the Word of God. Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers or fishermen. And he saith unto them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, which means immediately, left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other uh, brethren, brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. All four of these men entered a journey with the master fisherman. The title of the message tonight is Journey with the Master Fisherman. Let's ask the Spirit of God to speak this to our hearts tonight. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity of these days. Thank you, Lord, for this church. Lord, your body right here in this place, Lord, what you're doing. Lord, thank you for the hungry hearts. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd make this night count. And Lord, I know that... Uh, these people here wouldn't even be here tonight if they didn't have a heart for you and a heart to be used by you. Lord, tonight, would you equip us with truth? Uh, Lord, fill in some peace that's needed. Lord, stir us tonight with the reality of a journey with you that literally has impact on the souls of others. And so I plead the blood. Lord, protect us from Satan's attack tonight. Lord Jesus, I claim our position once again in you on the throne far above the enemy. I claim the victory that you won when you said it is finished. So in your name, we exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek, uh, Lord, to interfere tonight and trust you that that not be allowed. Lord, help us tonight. Give us help from heaven. Lord, use truth tonight to make a difference, not only in our lives, but in the lives of many around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in 1987 uh, that my father took my wife and I on one of his several trips over to the Bible Lands. And I remember how one night we were staying in a hotel on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And what a beautiful place. Uh, surrounded there by those mountains, a deep, deep lake. And uh, we got to thinking, you know, we're on the western shore. That means we could get up early and we could watch the sunrise uh, over the Sea of Galilee. So we got up early and we got out there and uh, we watched that sunrise. It was really, really special. Well, it would have been a morning like that when we read this account, because we know from the parallel account in Luke that these men fished during the night. Uh, we read right here that uh, a couple of the brothers are already mending their nets. They're bringing it in. And so it's, it's dawn, and Jesus comes by. Uh, 
Maybe that same spot on the western shore. I don't know. But he comes by where these men are there on the Sea of Galilee, and he says simple words to them. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Beautiful. Friend, tonight, let the Holy Spirit speak the words of Jesus right into your heart tonight, where he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Have we responded to this invitation by the master fisherman? Now, what is the invitation to? Well, the text unfolds here, really three, uh, three segments to the words here, and thus three parts uh, of uh, this invitation. First of all, there is the priority of personal relationship. Here in Matthew 4.19, when Jesus says follow, he says, follow me. That's fascinating. The immediate emphasis is on the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's often what we miss. For years, I followed fishing. <laughs> well, not really fishing for like... Minnesota fishing, but fishing for souls kind of thing, you know. Uh, Chicago, we didn't uh, have too many lakes around. Well, well, there was a big one <laughs> there by the city. But uh, at any rate, uh, I, you know, I, I worked at soul winning, and I studied soul winning and all those things, but I missed the relationship. And by the way, <laughs> I wasn't effective either, <laughs> because until you tap into that relationship with Jesus, then you're not, uh, you're not accessing the supernatural dynamic that's available. And so he says here, follow me. Now, in the parallel account in Mark 1, verse 17, the same word here translated follow, there is translated come. Come ye to me. Same word. It is the word that Jesus uses there in John chapter 11 when Lazarus has been dead uh, and uh, in the tomb for four days. And Jesus tells them, roll that stone away. And then he says, Lazarus, come. Come forth. That's the same word here. Follow me. Come after me. Ah, oh, that we would respond like Lazarus did. <laughs> and uh, in his case, they had to uh, uh, unwind all the stuff that was messing him up there. But he did come. Now, friends, Jesus has come. Follow me. You see, it's not just a command. It's an invitation. <laughs> It's not negative, it's positive. It's a warm invitation. Follow me, enter into a personal relationship with me. Get to know me. It's fascinating here. He doesn't say follow fishing. He doesn't say follow a career. He doesn't say follow a, a, a sanctification. He doesn't say follow service. He doesn't say follow a system. Fascinating, because those are the things we follow if we're not careful. He says, follow me. It's what we learned two nights ago. When you get to Jesus, the, then the outcome plays out right. <laughs> Wherever you are in your journey, which is going to be different for each one. It'll look exactly the same for any two. But the point is, we've got to get to Jesus. And so he says, follow me. Get to know me. Converse with me. And friends, I recognize uh, in this passage here, he was here in his earthly body. And he was uh, there talking to those people. But he is still here through his word and his spirit. And he is called the word. And again, when the Holy Spirit of Jesus gets involved in the equation, it's not just a matter of reading words and have an intellectual stimulation and chalk off your duty for the day and go on. No, it's meeting with a person. And friends, when we open the book, uh, in that personal time uh, where you're, you're looking to hear from heaven, ask the spirit of God to speak to you. Trust him to, look to him to, expect him to. And uh, because when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the truth that's connected to the words on the printed page, that's when we meet up with the living word himself. That's what we need. He says, follow me, get to know me. Ah, it's beautiful. Walk with me. Follow me. Yield to me. See, he's the leader. He's the power source. And we have the privilege of walking with him. And these disciples left their nets. In two of the brothers' cases, they left their father as well. Follow Jesus. They entered into that relationship. We know from John chapter 1, they were already believers. They were already saved. This is an invitation to this personal walk with the master fisherman himself. Now... 
If you feel like you're ineffective at leading people to Jesus Christ or have an impact on others in any kind of ministry, whether it's a children's class or whatever the case may be, get to Jesus. Because the overflow of Jesus flowing through you, that's what touches people around you. That's the dynamic that we desperately need. So there's the priority of personal relationships. Secondly, there's the promise of supernatural transformation. He says, follow me and I will make you. There it is. Here's the promise. I will make you. In the parallel passage in Mark, it says, I will make you to become. And the wording thus implies a process. See, entering into the relationship can be in a moment. But the growing part of it is a process. And that's why revival and spiritual maturity are not the same. When you get revived, it does not make you spiritually mature. It gets you back on the road of maturity. <laughs> and so uh, when we enter into this relationship with him, then he says, I will make you to become. And then he brings us along. And now we walk with him and we walk by faith. And that's when we grow in grace. And uh, he says, I will make you. You see, there's a promise here of supernatural transformation. It's beautiful. You see, he's the master fisherman. He'll equip us. You know, if he knows that uh, you need to know uh, more gospel truth, he'll prompt you. He'll stir you to, to study. And uh, sometimes he uh, may study to just do your own, uh, or stir you to do your own personal study. In some cases, he may lead you to take a course. There's all courses, of, uh, courses available. I mentioned one tonight, but there's other courses out there. Uh, the key is do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. He wants you to take a course, take a course. If he wants you to study on your own, study on your own. <laughs> but when you follow him, if he knows that you are uh, in need of more understanding yourself so that you can more clearly articulate the message, he'll lead you. And so, uh, you know, some, uh, one time in one of our courses, somebody said, well, you know, if you're telling us to depend on the, on the spirit, why do we need to take the course? <laughs> Got one in every class, you know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> that's a good question, though. But here's why. The Holy Spirit works through your faculties, not around them. If you've got truth in your mind, he can bring all things to your remembrance. But to bring them to your remembrance, as Jesus said in John 16, they've got to be in there. Ah, so if you only know a small piece of the gospel, the Holy Spirit's big enough to connect you to that person who just needs that small piece. And praise the Lord, he can still use you. But the more you know, the more understanding you have of this gospel message, then the greater the increase of your capacity of who God can lead you to reach with the gospel. See, there's the beauty of it. And as our culture gets more and more dumbed down, I think it's more and more uh, important for us to understand the message. And the better grip you got on it, the more clear it'll be as you speak it uh, when you're in a witnessing scenario. And so uh, he'll lead you in that. But not only will he equip you with truth, he'll equip you with power. You see, in my early days, it was, okay, we're supposed to go so winning, so let's do it. And quite honestly, I did it out of sheer obedience. <laughs> but I didn't really want to, but, you know, that's what we're supposed to do, so we got to. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I was a teenager in, in junior high and high school, I was in the youth group, and we had outreach and blah, blah. So I, I did all that stuff. I didn't really want to, but I was a preacher's kid. I, I figured it was expected. <laughs> uh, my dad never made me, but uh, uh, he might have. If I didn't, I don't know. I never tested those waters. I just went because I figured that's what I got to do. And even in college, you know, preacher boy, you go out and outreach and these different things and so forth. And I did it because it was the right thing to do. And I wanted to do right, but I didn't really want to go soul winning because I was still fearful and very ineffective and all those things. <laughs> you know, when you go by yourself, it's not so good. But when you go with Jesus, things change. <laughs> See, when I tried to obey just on my own, it was just, oh, man, it was drudgery. You know, let's do this because duty demands it, but there's no delight. There's no power. When God began to open my eyes to what I shared on Monday night in that mega grace journey, when God awakened me to the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you, oh, wow, what a radical change in whole perspective on this matter of the gospel because now you know you're not going alone. And when you go to the Lord and say, I need your power, and, and he promises to give it, Luke eleven thirteen, 13, you can take it. And now when you go, you can expect him to work. Wow. That's a big difference. 
And now when you knock on a door and, uh, and uh, nobody answers and you think, oh, good, nobody's home. <laughs> now you can knock on that door and say, I wonder if this is where we're going to see God work. Now, you know that God's going to guide you. You're asking the Lord of the harvest to connect you to the harvest, Matthew 9. There's all these truths that come into play and, uh, and so on. If it's not this one, fine. Let's get to where, we're, where he knows we need to get going and so on. And so the point is, he'll equip us with truth. He'll equip us with power. You can ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when it comes to Christ in you, that's already true. But when it cri- comes to Christ through you to somebody else, that you need to ask for. That's based on the promise. I like a Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall? See, there's a promise. Your heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit. And the idea there grammatically is Holy Spiritness, this power of the Spirit to those who ask. And so we can ask for the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit of God will, at some point as you're praying, say, you got it. That's when you stop asking and you take it. Thank you, Lord. Just like we've been emphasizing. And now when you go, you're not alone. And it doesn't matter how you feel. Sometimes you feel God carrying you. We love that. Other times you don't feel a thing. (laughs) But God's moving just the same. In fact, in my own personal experiences, the times when I don't feel anything, but the person gets overwhelmed with truth and calls on the name of the Lord, that's the most joyous because I didn't feel anything. But they did. And uh, sometimes God lets you know that he's carrying you. He knows you might need the encouragement. But if we always have to have the feeling, then we stop depending on Jesus and start depending on the feeling. That's why the Lord doesn't always give that feeling. But the point is, if you've asked, and you've taken, and now you're going, he's there. And we can trust him. And now we can have a confidence and an expectation for God to move. So he equips us with truth. He equips us with power. He also equips us with personal leadership. And in a situation where there's a bunch of people and you just feel impressed to give a track to that one, well, that's the Holy Spirit. See, he's the Lord of the harvest. He's working. He knows who's responding, and he knows how to connect you to that person if you're sensitive to him. It's an amazing thing where you can ask the Lord, Lord, you're, you know who you're working on. You know who's responding to. Would you connect me? And let me know. And he does. And there's a whole group of people, but it's this one you're supposed to talk to. And uh, this one you're to give that track to. And so on. So he leads. He also leads in various applications. You know, there's many different methods in getting the gospel out. Many. You know, we uh, for years, uh, door-to-door was pushed. It's a good method, but it's not the only method. And, uh, you know, when COVID hit, it was a hard one because <laughs> nobody wanted to open the door and talk to anybody. And then after COVID, got, people got sick of it. Then it was okay because then I did want to talk to people <laughs> and uh, so on. But, you know, all of, that's just one method. There's multiple methods. I remember when I was an assistant pastor in the Chicago area, west side uh, uh, Chicago. In those days, we had newspapers. Remember those things? <laughs> and uh, uh, before everybody did all their news, whatever, on their phone. But uh, the paper would announce in the various suburbs what families had new babies. It was just the thing they did. And so uh, uh, we had this thing for our ladies. Uh, it was a new birth evangelism. Play on words there. And uh, so uh, we'd find out in the new uh, paper where, uh, who was having a new uh, baby. And so our, lady would, would call, our ladies would call. And uh, they would figure it out because uh, they would say, so, you know, they'd give the husband and wife name or whatever it is. And then they would say, what suburb? So then we would look it up in the yellow pages. Remember those? And, uh, and uh, they would call and they would uh, say, hey, is this your first baby? And they would talk and chat and say, well, look, uh, we're from Market Manor Baptist Church and we have a, a special gift for your baby. We also have a special gift for you. We'd like to bring it by and we'd love to talk to you about Jesus. It was always up front. Half of them would say no. Half of them would say yes. So we'd set up an appointment. When we went, half of them stood us up. The other half didn't. And within a four-year period of time, we saw five entire family units saved, baptized, discipled, and assimilated into our church through that one application. Now, my point of saying that is not to do that application. The point is, God knows what application works here in Park Rapids now. So I ask him. I remember a church in Singapore. Uh, every year, the leadership of the church would get together, and they'd pray and fast for three days. Saying, all right, Lord, what are the applications this year? I love it. And God would lead them with neat applications. And uh, one time God burdened them about a corner in Singapore where uh, the rejects 
of Singapore, Singapore youth, this is where they hung out. In Singapore, uh, your score in school determines your placement in society. <laughs> How would you like that, young people? And uh, so uh, if you didn't do well in school, you are now, uh, you're definitely a reject. And see, so the kids usually have very good minds, but their parents are you know, never there. And so some of them, it's not that they didn't have a good mind. They just had other things happening in their life, and so they didn't score well. And now they're doubly rejected because their parents are ticked at them because they don't place well in society. And so these teenagers would hang out at a certain corner. They were the rejects. That was the corner nobody went to. And as this church was praying, one January, the Lord said, go to that corner. Bring Jesus to them. <laughs> and they did. And, oh, wow, I was in that church the first Sunday that two of those teenagers, the first teenagers from that corner that showed up at the church, I was there that Sunday preaching, and uh, what a delight. And afterwards, they witnessed to those kids. Both of them trusted the Lord. And they asked, why did you come? And they pointed to a very well-dressed, refined lady. He said, because of her. You know why? Because well-dressed, refined ladies don't go to that corner. But she brought Jesus to them. And they came, and they got saved. And over the next three months, they saw about 70 teenagers trust Christ. Man, hallelujah. You see, when you find out what the Lord's doing... Then when you join what he's doing, it, it's always good because he's already working. <laughs> when we try to work it up without him, oh, it's frustrating, disillusioning, you know, why even try? No, see, he knows what he's doing. He says, follow me and I will make you. And so he will lead us and he will guide us. Uh, we live in a day when people take courses. You know, there's courses everywhere on the internet, whatever. And so uh, some churches have grabbed a hold of this. And uh, they offer courses online. Uh, some of them uh, uh, offer a course right at the church. In fact, I was in a church one time. And sure enough, here's like 12 people. I don't know what it was. A group of people showing up at church for a four-week Bible study in the church building. They won't come to the church service, but they came to the course. Well, why not? In other words, it's not a matter of imitating another church. It's a matter of finding what the Holy Spirit wants you to do here, now. That's what God does. It's been interesting in recent years, several churches, the Lord has led to uh, start coffee shops. <laughs> and uh, it just uh, depends on the area, what the needs are and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, worked well for several of these churches. There's one church in Tennessee where uh, most of the people that are now in the church have come through the coffee shop to get to the church. That's how it worked. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just what God used in that scenario, that setting. The point is, if you'll pray and ask, God will lead you. And let's obey. Let's do it as individuals. Obviously, you can do it as a church. The point is, let's obey the Holy Spirit. God burdened one church to uh, get all of the people to figure out where their neighborhood was and you know what the, uh, the radius was around their house, and then uh, to meet all the people in that radius and memorize their names. Because when you can call somebody by name, it means something. It's called care. It's, you know, it's love. And uh, so uh, they would, uh, this was in a highly populated area, but you could do it in any area. And uh, they said, uh, every so often, walk your neighborhood. Out here, you might have to drive your neighborhood. <laughs> but go through the neighborhood and uh, look for where something needs to be fixed. And pop out and offer to do it. So that's what they would do. And again, that shows care. And then... They were trained that when the Spirit of God said, speak, and they were very sensitive to wait until he said, speak, then they would speak, and people would get saved, and then they'd start Bible studies out in the neighborhood, and then they would bring them right into the church, and they saw, in this particular case, this was in a big city, they saw hundreds of people saved. My point is, it's finding out what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. See, Jesus is the master fisherman. He's not surprised by modern technology. In fact, technology can be used for the gospel in amazing ways. I remember when, uh, when the third world countries were, were grabbing a hold of the, the cell phone thing, they didn't have money to use the phone line, but they could use the texting. I don't know how it all worked, but it was a lot cheaper. And uh, I was in a, a gospel setting one time where we were watching on a screen 
uh, when uh, a, a, a worldwide evangelistic organization uh, had a, a two-day goal of reaching, uh, um, I think they were wanted to reach a million people, <laughs> and uh, we were watching on the, on the screen uh, because it was all on the internet, and when somebody got that, uh, they got this ad, they paid for ads on these uh, uh, phones, the texting, and so somebody, let's say in uh, uh, Ethiopia or whatever, would click, I want to I wanna talk to somebody about Jesus, and then they had people uh, trained and ready to go, and they would do it electronically. And when a, so when a person was being talked to, a certain color of light went on. So we're watching the whole globe. And then if a person clicked that they had just trusted Christ, then the light would turn a different color. And we're watching them get saved. Pop, pop, pop <laughs> around the world, you know. And uh, it, was, uh, it was fascinating. You know, let's ask the Lord of the harvest. What do you want us to do? How do you want us to do this? And so forth. And you know, one of the biggest ways is just really being in tune with the Lord in your normal course of life. Because those people, you already know. And you know, the more Jesus shines, the more power there is when you speak. So the whole spirit for life thing isn't just for us to have victory so we can feel good about ourselves. No, it's for the Jesus shine to be there. Now Moses was not that his face shone. Uh, if you're thinking, you know, everybody's seeing Jesus today, they're not. But, <laughs> but when you're walking in the spirit, they are seeing Jesus. There's the Jesus look and the Jesus glow. I love it. Oh, wow. And when that's real, then when the, you know, you're in a scenario, just in your regular interaction with people, they may say, you know, just this, this such and such just happened. I don't know what to do. And they're in some trial. And now you can point them to Jesus. And with that Jesus look, there's power. Why? Because it's him. It's nothing weird. It's not I but Christ flowing through. Rivers of living water flowing. It is that aura, that fragrance of Jesus. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. A uh, 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 savor of life unto life to some, death unto death unto others. But it's him. And it's that shine uh, that you see in 2 Corinthians 3 uh, where they see him. You see, it's not physical, it's spiritual. But it's just as real as if it were physical. And they see the Lord. And friends, when you get in a conversation with somebody you already know, and there is that power of Jesus flowing in you and through you to them, and they trust the Lord, <laughs> it gets glorious because you already got all, all of the discipleships already established because <laughs> you know them. And so the point is, all of these things are things the Lord uses. It's not just one particular way. Just follow Jesus. And he says, I will make you. And he'll equip you with truth. He'll lead you to study what you need to. He'll equip you with power. Teach you to learn to, uh, to call on him and trust him to work. He'll equip you with methodologies. He'll guide you. And when that's very real, it's a blessing. I think of uh, Dr. Walter Wilson. Uh, he would pray, Lord, lead me today to that soul whose heart you prepared to receive the gospel. And he'd say, now, Lord, I'm pretty dense about it. Don't let me, don't let me miss. Now you can look it up on the internet, just what the doctor ordered, soul winning stories by Walter Wilson. And he just talks about everyday life in the barber shop, uh, wherever, uh, where God stirs him. Hey, this is the one. And he would engage the person in conversation, and uh, uh, multitudes of people came to Christ. You know what's been neat to me in our netcasters? Uh, we teach all that, and uh, it's been a delight to see people that that don't have books on the internet, but their stories are just as good. Because they learned to follow Jesus. They learned to have an actual relationship with the Holy Spirit. They learned to say, God, would you lead me today to that soul whose heart you've prepared? Show me where you're working. And Lord, don't let me miss. And when you stirred me to speak, Lord, I'm going to trust you to empower me to obey and to do something, to accomplish your purpose. And, uh, and then uh, when God gives you that moment, then follow through. Watch God work. So there's the priority of relationship. There's the promise of transformation. And now finally, there's the purpose of making disciples. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In Luke 5, he says, from now on, you will catch men. That is, 
catch alive. In other words, you'll win people to Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. I remember a church over in Singapore where they got burdened to witness to Muslims. Now, that was significant because in Singaporean culture, you can proselytize any person except a Muslim because, uh, you know, the nation to the north is Malaysia, that's Muslim, to the south is Indonesia, that's big time Muslim. And so in order not to have political problems in Singapore, uh, you can witness to a Buddhist, you can witness to a Catholic, you can witness to a Hindu, but you're not supposed to proselytize a Muslim. And so this church, uh, the very church I was telling you about that uh, saw God work in so uh, a number of different ways, they witnessed to everybody but Muslims because you could get kicked off the island, you get kicked out of the country, exiled. It's a big deal. But one of those prayer meetings that they had in January, the Lord said, trust me, and witness to the Muslims. But there was a young girl, about 20-ish, who told the Lord, Lord, if you stir me to witness to a Muslim, I'm going to trust you to empower me to obey. So she was at an outdoor uh, uh, food area where they had a lot of different food stands and so on. And they, they can tell the different cultures and so forth. When you live in a country like that, they, they, they figure all that out. And she knew who was Muslim and who wasn't just by, she could tell, just by looking. <laughs> and because she lives there. And uh, uh, there was a, a, a Muslim girl across the way. And the Lord said, I want you to witness to her. And so here's what she did. She said, Lord, <laughs> I told you that if you stirred me to witness to a Muslim, I was going to obey. But I got to make sure this is you. <laughs> So she said, if this is the one that I'm really supposed to talk to, I'm going to look back over there, and Lord, would you have that girl look up at me and smile? And she looked over. The girl was sitting there and looked up and smiled. So she obeyed. And that girl, the Muslim girl, put her faith in Jesus. She called her mom, who lived in Indonesia, to tell her. Now, she could get killed. She could get kicked out of the family. Whatever. She called the mom and said, Mom, I have to tell you, today I became a born-again Christian. The mother began to weep and says, how can I become a Christian? They sent a gospel team and led the entire village to Christ right in Indonesia. Now, friends, Jesus knows what he's doing. When he said to those fishermen, launch out in the deep, he knew where the fish were. That's not normally where they would go. But in our same world... You know, the Muslim world, well, that's not normally where they're going to go in the, if you live in Singapore. But God knows what he's doing. And yes, sometimes he does allow persecution. But the point is, when we follow him, he says, I will make you fishers of men. I remember I was in a Nets seminar one time, and I had uh, two uh, trainees with me. We do uh, um, three-person double-gender teams for training purposes. So I had a, a young lady and a young man that were my trainees, and... Uh, the way it works in the module that we have, uh, that we used to do in those days, on the first day, we'd go out on the turf, and I would do the witnessing, and they would watch, to, and I would, boy, we'd always have a prayer meeting first, and <laughs> say, God, you got to work, uh, they've got to see you work today, and so the Lord would be gracious, and then the next day, uh, we would go back and forth. Uh, they would do as much as they were ready. If they freaked out, couldn't remember what to say, they would look back at uh, us as the trainer and say, is there anything you would like to add? <laughs> Boy, everybody memorized that phrase. <laughs> and so uh, we would pick it up, and uh, if they were ready, they'd give us the nod, and we'd toss it back. And, and uh, so we have this ping-pong kind of uh, witnessing that we do on day two. And then on day three, they got to go. Now, we'll bail them out if we have to, but they got to go. Well, I had this young girl. She had never led a soul to Christ. She'd been in church uh, her whole life, but she had never led a soul to Christ. She was, she was shy, and she was timid, and she was petrified. <laughs> but it's day three, and she knows it. Well, when we had our prayer meeting, I'm going to tell you, that girl prayed. <laughs> There's something about obedience in the gospel that can really instigate a good prayer meeting. <laughs> Because people realize, God, if you're not with me, this is going to be a real mess and a total waste of time and might be uh, uh, embarrassing and whatever. So, boy, we prayed. And she prayed. We all prayed. And we went out. And uh, she used that little orange gospel booklet track that we were, uh, uh, I was showing you a minute ago. And uh, we were out in a big city area. And there were two teenagers on the street. I said, all right, Christy, let's go up to these teenagers. 
And uh, since that's uh, the Lord said, you know, you just know. <laughs> and so we did. And uh, she took that track. Now, it's meant for her to fill in, you know, and kind of fill it out and engage in conversation. All she did was ask if she could uh, talk to them and awkwardly, and they said yes. <laughs> and she just awkwardly read it with no filling in the details. She just, well, it's a gospel track. I mean, there's enough there. But <laughs> it was like kind of awkward. But the teenage, they were just there with big open eyes and they were right with her. And she reads through that whole track. And then when she asked her, you know, are you willing to trust Jesus? They said, well, yes. <laughs> God had prepared them for their sakes and for hers. Because they got saved and she got lit up. She saw that without human prowess, with truth and the spirit, God worked. And she joined a mission team the next summer and was used of God to leave over 400 people to Jesus Christ in the Philippines. You know, it was neat. Last fall, I was in a meeting over in Wisconsin, and uh, I hadn't seen that girl for years, but she was in that church. So one night, I told that story, and I said, and she's sitting right over there. <laughs> well, friends, Jesus said, follow me. You know, if you've never led a soul to Christ, it doesn't have to stay that way. And it's not just somebody who's 20. I've had adults in meetings, people who have been saved for years. So you know what? Jesus, I'm going to follow you. This is what you said. And now they can testify that they've led their first soul, and in many cases, many, many other souls since. Friends, this is what Jesus does. He cares. And there are people that are hurting big time all around us. And with all the chaos in our world today, it shows you that people are searching. And there's a lot of people with common sense that are wondering what in the world is going on. And if we're in tune with the Spirit, He can lead us. We don't have to force things. But we can be tuned. We can be looking to Jesus. And yes, He'll author and finish faith, and we will be used of him. He will make us to become fishers of men. He said so. So let's heed his invitation to follow him.